Hi, I'm Cliff. And I'm Scott. And we are not here today to teach you how to be weird. Nope, because even though we can't actually see any of you right now in person, uh, Scott and I are quite confident that each and every one of you is at least a little bit weird. Be honest with yourself. What we are here to do is to teach you how to leverage that wonderful weirdness to make magic for others. So the last time Scott and I were involved in a Marketing Profs event, we were actually helping to kick off the 2019 Marketing Profs B2B Forum. And we actually came out uh, during that event on stage dressed in full Fred Rogers regalia. And rest assured, if we were all actually occupying the same space today, Scott and I would have cooked up something even more theatrical than that. Yeah, I think one part TED Talk and one part David Byrne on Broadway. Mm, it would have been epic. But of course, we are presenting to you today through a pre-recorded broadcast remotely. So sadly, our options for theatrics are a little bit limited. But on the plus side, since we're not filming this in front of a live studio audience, we do have the ability to make you laugh whenever we want to. <laughs> or... If we want, we could also cause you to applaud our singular genius. Thank you, thank you so much, seriously, thank you. Thank you. You're too kind, but we can do more than that. Uh, instead of just making you clap or laugh if the spirit moves us, we could rig up an instant costume change. So yeah, we can change our clothes instantly, which is convenient and a little weird. Yes, uh, a little weird, but if, if we want to make things really, really weird, Scott and I actually have the ability, we haven't really told many people about this, but we have the ability to actually change ourselves into Muppets. Hey Cliff, how do I look? With your eyes, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> uh, being a Muppet is a great way to keep your attention but it's not without its own hazards. Yeah, that, uh, that might be a little distracting. Agreed. <laughs> All right, well, now that we've wallowed in our own weird for a sec, let's talk a little bit about weird ideas. If you think about it, some of the greatest ad campaigns in history have been built on some pretty characteristically weird ideas. Remember this? Uh, wasn't born yet. Me neither. How about this though? Oh, I was eight and I loved it. Expert manipulation. Mm. Funny for no reason. This was one big non sequitur. Yep, this uh, doesn't take itself too seriously. Gotta respect that. And speaking of which, uh, how about apologizing while still kind of being naughty? <laughs> all enormously successful campaigns and all enormously weird. But this isn't just a B2C thing. B2B marketers have been doing a lot of weird for a long time. Yeah, so, so take a look at an example here. This is an old farming equipment ad, and they use the image of this horde of busy elves to represent the incredible efficiency of their machine. So, you know, an ad like this, it might haunt your dreams, but you won't soon forget it. It's fun to look at ads from the personal collection of Cliff Lewis. Uh, this one's from 1958, and Ad Age actually referred to it as the number one B2B ad of the 20th century. Now, it's pretty remarkable. This ad basically says that if you're not paying attention to your customers and you're not paying attention to your markets, you're going to get looked at like this. And that's not to mention all of the, the more recent examples of wonderfully weird B2B campaigns that we've seen from Epson receipt printers or John Deere wheel loaders or Partner Engineering and Science Incorporated or even McNeilis garbage trucks. Hey, we did that one. Yeah, and, and off also, we, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention perhaps our favorite Super Bowl ad of all time, which is also a B2B ad, um, and quite the tearjerker. This is from GE. Take a look. Ideas are scary. They come into this world ugly and messy. Ideas are frightening because they threaten what is known. They are the natural born enemy of the way things are.
Yes, ideas are scary and messy and fragile. But under the proper care, they become something beautiful. Beth Comstock was the CMO at GE during the time that that ad was produced. And here's what she had to say. To get an edge on the future and graze on something new, you have to be willing to go weird. So why is it that weird has always worked so well in marketing communications? Well, science can offer us a few clues. Psychology identifies two primary modes of human thought. So on the one hand, you have convergent thinking, otherwise known as the closed mindset. And convergent thinking is, is really defined as the pursuit of one single correct solution. On the other hand, you have divergent thinking, which as the open mindset is the pursuit of multiple new solutions. So an easy way to remember that is to think of divergent thinking as tapping into your inner five-year-old and to think of convergent thinking as activating your inner accountant. Right, and as human beings, we really do need both sides of thought, and we all do both closed and open, divergent and convergent thinking. But anytime you shift your perception or form a new preference or change your mind about anything, that is divergent thinking at work. Basically, if you want your audience to change their buying behavior, you're gonna to wanna to encourage divergent thinking. And if you want to encourage divergent thinking, the best way to do it is by priming your audience with weird ideas. Now, odds are, if you're attending this session, you don't need that much convincing about the power of weird. And we'd be willing to bet that deep down inside, you're also aware of the fact that your own weird harbors great potential. You just want to know how to use it. So maybe you've envied the divergent thinking that you've seen in some of those B2C campaigns or even perhaps other B2B players in your space. But how exactly do you find those ideas? And how do you refine them into something that can extend across an entire campaign? Most importantly, how do you present those ideas to people who are in the position to not only allow them to see the light of day, but also to fund them? Right, so Scott and I have had to answer these questions many, many times in our careers, and we've led teams in developing many, many weird ideas. And at this point in our lives, we've really gotten it down to something of a science, and we have a consistent method that we use every time we need to discover a weird idea. We're gonna share that method with you today. We see it playing out in three major phases. Phase one, start with boring. Phase two, Goof with purpose, very, very important, very serious. Phase three, sell the weird. Now, we typically spend between two hours and a full day teaching this method in much greater detail. But right now, we've only got about 10 minutes, so we're gonna be moving at a brisk pace. Now, if you miss anything, in lieu of our slides, we've actually provided this handy document that condenses each step down to its bare essentials. So, if we're ready, Let's get weird. Let's. Before you begin generating weird ideas, you need to start with a statement that's entirely unweird and uncreative. So this is where you're setting up your core message or your central strategy statement, whatever you call it. But what we recommend is that you draft this statement in a clean room, set all of the weird aside and save it for later. So we're gonna give you an example of this using a, a fictional B2B SaaS company called Inatech. You might have heard of them. Uh, and for this campaign, this would be that core statement. Inatech offers the most secure TPS reporting platform in the banking industry. You want a statement that's short, in the neighborhood of eight words to 12, like this one. And it needs to say one thing. You want the statement to be specific, which precisely defines your offering, in this case, TPS reporting in the banking industry. And finally, you want to look for a superlative. Look for words like most, best, or only. In this case, it is the most secure within its category. So once you have this statement, what you want to do is get it in front of the top decision makers, whether it's internal or external. Rule of thumb, anyone who might have the power to kill your weird idea later down the line once you've found it. Get this statement in front of them and get their approval as soon as possible because 
further down the line in the process, when you've discovered a weird idea and things are getting a little weird, you're gonna to wanna to remind them that this ironclad statement that they have embraced lies at the heart of even your wildest thinking. Okay, so now we're getting to the really fun part. This is when you get to move from the very business-like, no-nonsense world of the core message and into this living, breathing, full-bodied life of the weird idea. It's time to goof with purpose. This is when you encourage your teams to consider every possible manner of restating what's in your core message. No filters allowed, but that doesn't mean it's a free-for-all. Right, so for one thing, you're gonna to wanna to be reminding yourself and reminding your teams that every single idea, no matter how weird, and you definitely want weird, but every single idea still needs to be rooted in that core message. So weird but meaningful. That's really what you're going for here. Now, to start drumming up those ideas, you'll need to give your teams some time as individuals, duos, or small groups. When they do that, here's a weird trick that always seems to work. For those early brainstorming sessions, schedule 90 minutes. You need a starting point and an end point. Give yourself 30 minutes of pure, gloriously unproductive and useless banter. And then you'll find that you'll easily get two hours worth of ideas in the remaining 60 minutes. And it was only after Scott and I had stumbled across this principle through trial and error and put it into practice for a few years that we discovered that we really weren't the first people to figure this out. In fact, many others had come across the idea of this 90 minute window before us. So just for example, here's a, here's a quote from John Cleese, uh, Monty Python co-founder John Cleese. Uh, he says, I suggest you schedule about an hour and a half. And then after you've gotten into the open mode, you'll have an hour left for something to happen. So once you've had your 90 minute sessions, you should be ready to get everyone together for that first big corral, that first big meeting of all those crazy ideas. And if we have one piece of advice for how you conduct this gathering, it would be this, don't hold back. Some of the best weird ideas start out so weird that nobody thinks to share them, or they might be really self-conscious about sharing them. So you'll need to foster an environment where everybody feels safe lets down their defenses, gets vulnerable, and puts all their cards on the table. Yeah, so one of our favorite ways to create a pro weird session is to actually offer an award for the most fearless, ridiculous, completely untenable idea on the table. We call it the best worst idea award. And we've seen our teams bring a lot of contenders. Ideas involving hard hat wearing skeletons, uh, construction equipment, playing game shows, even F-bomb riddled headlines every once in a while. And one of those, we won't say which, actually wound up becoming a real campaign. So bring everything, because you really never know which weird idea might ultimately, after collaboration and discussion, become the weird idea that drives an entire campaign. And while we're on the subject of holding things back, Scott, I really hate to put you on the spot with this, but for the last few minutes, I've just been getting this vibe from you, like there, there's something on your mind that, that, you're not, that you're not sharing with the group. Maybe. Maybe. I can see it in your eyes, Scott. Now, I mean, think, listen, man, I mean, after everything we've said about holding back, what kind of example is this for the kids watching at home, you know, if, if we're holding back our own ideas now? Okay, okay, fine. So I was thinking about Inatech being the most secure TPS reporting platform, and it got me thinking about security and about bank security and about security guards and about the Secret Service. And well, I thought, what if we actually branded like an Inatech branded Nerf gun, right? Like kind of a metaphor for security. Hmm, okay. Well, first of all, Scott, this belongs to you. That was very brave. Um, but also, I can see some real potential in this idea of a metaphorical security object. Um, you might wanna just sand down uh, like the weaponry angle a little bit because that could come across as threatening to, to some of our audience. But beyond that, I think, I think you've got some real potential with this idea here. Point taken. You are now ready for the third and final stage of weird idea development. Right, you've caught yourself some weird ideas. You've refined them to line up with your core message. Mm -hmm. And you've hammered those weird ideas into something that's pretty much ready to pitch. I've got to tell you right now, just full disclosure, this is the scariest part of the entire process. 
This is the part where you take your weird ideas into some of the most unweird places in the universe. The C-Suite Boardroom, or the C-Suite Zoom Room, as the case may be. Same problem, these are environments where convergent thinking reigns supreme, rules the day, we're looking at bottom lines, we're looking at avoiding risk. Divergent thinking is at best a rare but embarrassing necessity. A little part of my inner child just, just burst into tears hearing you say that. But, but here's the thing, we gotta soldier on. So here's how you survive the C-suite. Dress your divergent thinking in a convergent thinking power suit. Make the weird idea feel like a perfectly rational suggestion. First thing you'll wanna do is go back to that short, specific, superlative core message. So by starting with the strategy that they've already approved, this audience is gonna be more invested in whatever comes to follow it. So if you play your cards right, they might just end up feeling like your weird ideas are, are kind of an extension of their own. After that, you're gonna to wanna to give them a definition of your weird idea. Like the core message, this is very literal. You're making a rational appeal in favor of your approach. So connect the dots between the core message and the weird idea in as few words as possible. So going back to our fictional Inatech example and remembering Scott's concept of a security object, we could end up with a definition statement that sounds like this. Convey a feeling of total security by playfully associating the Inatech brand with objects of comfort. So we've swapped comfort for security, which makes sense. Now that they're starting to picture something, you wanna direct their mind's eye with a little bit of visual inspiration. Show them some examples of successful campaigns and pop cultural touch points that embody the spirit of your approach. So here we're showing examples of popular campaigns that used unusual merchandise as an opportunity to tell a story about what their brand represents, like we have Finger looking nail polish from KFC or sneakers because America runs on Dunkin'. And the science backs up this approach. So Jennifer Mueller is a Wharton scholar and she's conducted tons of controlled studies on creativity in the world of business. And this is what she had to say about these kinds of presentation moments. By drawing comparisons between your ideas and other ideas in a different category, you make it more likely that listeners will have the kind of creative aha moment that results in feelings of interest, enjoyment, and surprise, the kinds of feelings that make people want to share, buy, and embrace ideas. So there you have it. Inspiration boards are a peer-reviewed best practice. When you've combined definition and inspiration, you'll be moving their imagination that much closer to where you're headed. They're picking up what you're putting down and you're making the weird idea really feel like the perfect inevitable conclusion. Mm, and now, and now, the moment I'm sure you've all been waiting for, it's time to play the music. Dare I say, it's time to light the lights. It's time to introduce your weird idea. Now, when you do, just remember, this can be a rough prototype. You've already primed them with inspiration and definition. So you've got their imagination in the right neighborhood. So if you just wanna show up with something as simple as a pencil sketch or a loose wireframe or a, a, a rough uh, video storyboard or whatever the deliverable is, uh, that should be totally fine. Now, for our purposes today, we're gonna show you something a little bit more developed. So here's a weird idea for you. We've designed a weighted blanket for software engineers. TPS reporting that helps you feel secure. Right, so if you think about it, it's pretty weird for a SaaS company to advertise a blanket. Uh, but a security blanket takes on a whole new meaning when you're talking about the most secure TPS reporting platform. And it doesn't just have to be blankets. This weird idea could repeat itself through an extended campaign with a whole line of comforting products that make people feel secure. Every touch point is weird and unexpected, but every touch point feeds directly into that core brand message, comfort and security. So I want you to picture yourself in that C-suite environment, and I want you to picture yourself looking around the table. This is the moment when you start to see some heads nodding, you start to see some smiles forming, and you start to see some thumbs turning up because your weird idea is going to live another day. That 
is how you catch, tame, and train weird ideas. Even in your B2B industry, it can be done. That's right, it can be. You just have to remember to start with boring and establish a short, specific, superlative core message, goof with purpose, and consider every single idea. Mind the depths as long as they support the message. And three, sell the weird. Make your weird ideas feel like the most rational conclusion in the world. Now, this framework doesn't guarantee that every single left brain gatekeeper is going to embrace every single one of your weirdest ideas. But what it does ensure is that you can discover weird, wonderfully weird ideas in any industry, and that once you've found them, you can package them and present them in a way that makes sense for people who don't think like you. If we leave you with one final word today, we want it to be the same thing that we started with. You are weird. Totally weird. And we mean that in the most encouraging possible way. Think about it like this. When you were five years old, you told weird stories, you played weird games, you drew weird pictures, and every single one of them was a masterpiece. You knew it, and the people who cared about you, they, they knew it too. Now, I want you to just remember that all of that wild, wonderful, weird creativity still lives somewhere up here, just waiting to come back out into the world. Legendary art director and this creative guru, James Victoria, probably said it and frankly painted it best right here. The things that made you weird as a kid make you great today. So when we tell you that you are weird, we're really telling you that you're wonderful. So don't be afraid to show it. We'll now take your questions 